I'm grateful to you for uh, giving up your time on a Friday evening to come and hear these things. I hope they will be useful to you. This is not the kind of thing that I am most comfortable doing. Uh, in many ways, I would rather be preaching to you than giving this lecture to you. But I do hope it will be, as I say, useful, and in some ways it may be necessary. Now, as I do this, as Pastor Brian has already said, I have to move quite quickly because I want to try and get everything covered in around about an hour or so. Now, in order to do that, not only do we need to move quickly, but I will also have to use some more technical language as a sort of a shorthand to explain certain things. Now, if I will try and explain what I need to, but if you wonder what on earth I am talking about, please ask during the question and answer time, and we can try and make things plain then. I was first introduced to or exposed to the new Calvinism in the early 1990s. It didn't have that name then. But a friend of mine in England gave me a book by a man called John Piper, and the title of that book was Desiring God. And he said to me, you have to read this book, it will change your life. I read the book because a good friend had told me it was a wonderful book and would change my life. It was a reasonable book. But I saw things in it and read things in it that I was not so sure about. But over time, more and more people began to use the name John Piper and other names which I will introduce to you, both in America and in the UK and further away. And there was a lot of pressure on me to become part of this movement. Many of my peers, many pastors my own age were becoming taken up with these things. And so I tried to study it, to follow it, to understand it, and to assess it. Now, if we go to the first full slide, I have some caveats before I begin. Caveat is a Latin word that means the things you need to be careful about. So, first of all, it is a partial snapshot. Sometimes a photographer will set up in a jungle something that's called a camera trap. And when an animal walks past the camera, the camera takes a picture. And it's usually a funny angle, and you only get a little bit of the animal. Well, when you talk about the new Calvinism, you're getting the picture from a camera trap. It's a new animal. It's only a bit of the picture. And every time you take a new picture, you learn a little bit more. So this is a very new movement, and in some ways it's still developing, and we are still learning about it. So some of the things that you hear tonight, most of the things will be in the book. But there are some new things, because new things have come to light. Secondly, it's a personal and pastoral assessment. Uh, these are things that I, as a Christian, and as a pastor of my particular church, in contact with some particular friends, I have had to wrestle with because I, it has been necessary for me. And what I'm trying to do is to give you what I hope is the benefit of the things that I have had to work through. Then I am trying to give a fair perspective and a righteous reaction. Paul says to Timothy, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Now I am not saying that all new Calvinists have been taken in the snare of the devil. What I am saying is, this is the spirit that I am trying to deal with, or to deal in. Because there are some people who are not fair about the new Calvinism, as I will explain in a moment. And our reaction must be a righteous one. We are not trying to shoot down the enemy unless they are the enemy. There are times when we wish to engage with brothers, to recover those who are in error and to expose those 
who are false. And we have to do that at every point. And then the most important caveat, the new Calvinism is a spectrum, not a monolith. Okay, a spectrum. It is a range of different people with different ideas about different things. It is not a monolith that is a single united item. So, you have to ask, what does this new Calvinist think about this particular thing? It is not always easy to say, new Calvinists believe this, that, and the other thing. Now, I've been criticized because when we come to look at what new Calvinism is, people want a very rigid definition. New Calvinists think this, believe this, act like this, do this, and don't do this. But it's hard to do that when you are dealing with such a range of people. And that's why it's important to have a fair perspective, because you cannot accuse everybody of the same faults, nor commend everybody for the same righteous deeds. And we'll come back to that in our conclusions. So I have to paint in fairly broad strokes, but I'm trying to give a fair perspective with a righteous reaction along the spectrum. So let's move on secondly now to the characteristics and qualities of the new Calvinism. The characteristics and qualities of the new Calvinism. The first of them is Calvinism. At which point you might think, who's this idiot who's been asked to speak about the new Calvinism and tells us it's about Calvinism? Well, let me explain why I say Calvinism and what I mean by Calvinism. There are different definitions of Calvinism and it fits in different ways into the broader idea of what it means to be a reformed Christian. Now, most narrowly, you could talk about Calvinism as belonging to the, having to do with the five points of Calvinism. Uh, total depravity and so on. Unconditional election, limited atonement, uh, irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. And most new Calvinists would believe what lies at the heart of that system, which is that God is sovereign in salvation. In that sense, most new Calvinists are Calvinists. They believe in a sovereign God saving the unworthy. But that is not necessarily the same as being a reformed Christian. The theologian B.B. B. Warfield said that the essence of Calvinism consists in a profound apprehension of God in his majesty with the inevitably accompanying poignant or striking and powerful realization of the exact nature of the relation sustained to him, to God, by the creature as such, and particularly by the sinful creature. When the sinful soul rests in humble, self-emptying trust purely on the God of grace. So Calvinism involves seeing God in his glorious majesty, man in his terrible sinfulness, seeing the gulf between the two, and the mercy of God in reaching out to save sinners. And responding then in a desire to bring glory to the God of salvation. Now most new Calvinists would agree with that. But the fact is that if you want to bring glory to the God of your salvation, that has to show itself all the way through your life as individuals and as churches. And that is where true reformation comes in and where true reformation is not always present in the new Calvinism. So one of the titles that is given to this movement is the young, the restless, uh, or the young, the reformed, and the restless. But there's a question about whether or not they truly are reformed because that depends on your definition. Now another thing is that some new Calvinists are not even Calvinists. They are what is called Amiraldians. That means they do not necessarily believe that God's salvation was definite 
in its extent that when Christ died, he died to save his people from their sins. Uh, an Amaraldian would more typically say that God, Christ died to save everybody, but that only those who believe through sovereign grace will be saved. That's a very uh, casual definition. Some new Calvinists talk about unlimited, limited atonement, which sounds very clever and isn't. But the Calvinism of the new Calvinism is perhaps best defined, I think, my, my persuasion, it is the theology of Jonathan Edwards mediated by John Piper. Okay? John Piper is a student of Jonathan Edwards. And in many respects, I could not begin to compare to John Piper in terms of his understanding and reading of Jonathan Edwards. But I do think that Mr. Piper, in communicating what Jonathan Edwards believed, has been somewhat selective in what he takes and has put his own spin on how he communicates it. So one of the key statements in the New Calvinism is that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him, which is the key statement of Christian hedonism, which is the title that is usually given to John Piper's theology. So Calvinism. The next thing is characters. You could call them figureheads, the men at the, the head, or personalities or celebrities or gurus, depending on who they are and how they act. You may have heard of some of the following names. John Piper, Mark Dever, C.J. Mahaney, Albert Moeller, Mark Driscoll, Matt Chandler, Francis Chan, Kevin DeYoung, Ligon Duncan, Tim Keller, Don Carson, Wayne Grudem, Tim Challies, and Justin Taylor. Has anybody heard of any of those names? Okay. Put your hand up if you've heard of one or two of them, please. Put your hand up if you think you've heard of most of them or all of them. Okay, some of the students. Put your hands up, and there's nothing to be embarrassed about if you're thinking, I have no idea who any of those men are. Okay, most of you have heard of one or two of them then, at least. Even if you haven't, the reason why this is important is that pretty much every visitor from America and England, including many of the missionaries who will be coming to your country, will either have heard of these people or will be in some measure their disciples. Not all of them, but these men will be the key influences on the people who may be influencing you and your churches. And the reason why that is important can be summed up in the story told by a Baptist theologian called Andrew Fuller. Now, this is particularly delightful because today is Andrew Fuller's birthday. He was born about 250 years ago, but it's still his birthday. Now, Andrew Fuller told a story about how when he was a young man, he tried to plow across a field. And the mark of a master plowman was to be able to go across the grooves of the field and plow a straight line. Yeah, you understand? So Fuller thought, well, I can be a master plowman. I will put my plow alongside the master's line and follow him. When he got to the other side of the field, he turned round, he looked back, and he saw that not only was his line not very straight, but he had exaggerated all the kinks, all the mistakes in the master's line. And the reason why then this is important is that not only are we now being influenced by the first men, who are men who are often profoundly intelligent, very able, gifted theologians, and who seem to be able to hold certain things together that may seem to be against one another. We are now being influenced also by their disciples. And their disciples will exaggerate the kinks. When you get down to the level of ordinary churches like ours, you will see that not everybody is able to put together everything that some of these top men do. So imitation can be a real danger. Then conglomeration. 
conglomeration. By that I mean banding together, holding together. The new Calvinism is a movement of coalitions, like the Gospel Coalition, conferences, like the Gospel Coalition conferences, and together for the Gospel and desiring God, networks and networks of networks. And they all know one another. And sometimes those networks are more important than the local church. That is where a lot of the teaching comes from. Now, it's important to understand that some of these groups think of themselves as center-bounded sets rather than boundary-bounded sets. Now, again, you might be thinking, okay, he's lost me there. Center-bounded sets are where a group is defined by the things that they have in common, however many or however few. Okay? So we could have a center-bounded set here. Everybody who's wearing a blue shirt is part of the center-bounded set. Yeah? That's what we have in common. Okay, Pastor Mom thinks she's in. All right, good. <laughs> Everybody's part of the same gang. A boundary-bounded set is where we say there is a boundary around us, there is a wall around us, and everybody who's inside the wall is part of that group. Okay, do you understand the difference? Now, you can be inside the wall, but not wearing a blue shirt. You can be outside the wall, but wearing a blue shirt. That's going to make a difference to which group you belong to, isn't it? Depending on how you think. Now, suppose we say that the blue shirts are the people who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the boundary walls are the people outside it are the people who believe that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Okay? Or you say the blue shirts are the people who say that God is great. Okay, are we all wearing blue shirts? Yeah, God is great. Yes? Yeah, cool. God is great. But if you're standing outside the wall wearing a blue shirt and the wall is the boundary of the people who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, does it matter if you're wearing a blue shirt? No. Are you a Christian if you're standing outside the wall? Not if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It doesn't matter if you've got on a blue shirt. Okay? If you're still standing outside that wall, you don't belong. The new Calvinism is a blue shirt group. And it's blue shirt about certain things. The problem is that there are people who are standing outside the wall of orthodox Christianity wearing blue shirts. And they're saying, well, I've still got a blue shirt on. I belong inside. But if there are certain truths that you do not believe, you do not belong in the church of Jesus Christ, do you? Or if there are certain things that you say are true that are false, you do not belong. The new Calvinism is happy at some points to have people standing outside the walls of orthodoxy wearing blue shirts. So these groups aren't always well defined by orthodox truth. And then consolidation and cracks. It's a group that's slowing down and settling down, but where there have already begun to be divisions that begin to show. And we'll look at some of those in due course. I need to move on because I don't want to spend too much time. But really what you're looking for, if you're asking, what is the new Calvinism? It's people who would generally talk about the glory of God, especially in the salvation of sinners, and who quote and are under the influence of some of those men who are happy to operate in these groups and networks and have seen this development in the movement over time. It's a very brief definition. You may think it's not a very good definition. If so, you can happily ask a question later. Let's move on to commendations. Commendations. Six things that are good about the new Calvinism. First of all, it sets out to be Christ-oriented and God-honoring. And that is the sincere desire of most who would call themselves new Calvinists. Probably all they would all say they want to exalt Christ and glorify God. But again, remember the first question of the Shorter Catechism. 
What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him. Piper. According to John Piper, man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. So our enjoyment of God leads to the glory of God. Now, John Piper would qualify that very carefully. But not everybody who quotes John Piper qualifies it as carefully as John Piper does. Again, remember that this is Jonathan Edwards filtered through John Piper. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And as we'll see when we come on to the cautions, that introduces certain problems. So, sets out to be Christ-oriented and God-honoring. And where that is true, and where that is accomplished, I would say praise God for his goodness to his creatures saved by grace. Then it's a grace-soaked movement. They love to talk about grace. They always talk about the gospel. Uh, everything is gospel-oriented. or it's, it's, you know, We're going to have a gospel conference with gospel sermons where gospel people come and buy gospel books uh, and wear gospel glasses and sit on gospel chairs. It almost gets a little bit silly to keep using that phrase because it doesn't always... It isn't always used in a very careful and thoughtful sense. But that's what they're at least seeking to do. You see, you listen to someone again like John Piper, or like Mark Dever, or like Albert Moeller, and you listen to these men and you know that grace is amazing to them. Why should God have saved a sinner like me, they ask? And they see something of the glory and the majesty of God. Now, in some older Reformed traditions, we say, is grace amazing? Yes, it is. Is God wonderful? Yes, He is. Shall we praise Him with joy? Yes, let's do that. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't sound like it. And it doesn't always feel like it. When some young Christians from within that older Reformed tradition look at some of these men, they say, that's how I want to be. I want to love God the way that man loves God. I want to glorify God and be excited by grace the way that man is excited by grace. Now, in the Philippines, you might say, are you telling me that there are Reformed Christians who don't have a deep and true and certain joy in God? Who don't have this upwelling and overflowing delight in the God of salvation? I'm sorry to say that that is true. And in my country, there are some people who have given true Calvinism, true Reformed faith, a bad name. Because they do not seem to rejoice in the God of their salvation. The new Calvinists, both older and younger, at least seem to be doing that. And for that I would say, praise God. Then it's a missional movement. Uh, They they talk about uh, being missional. That's the the adjective that is used. They're concerned to preach and plant and disciple new Christians. And they are often very willing to do these things. They take the opportunities that God gives them. Again, this is my perspective. In my country, some Reformed Christians were so terrified of unbelievers that we never talked to them. I had an experience once where a group of teenagers from the streets around my home church came into the the church building just before a service. I'd been going out and and inviting them in uh, every Sunday, and this was the first time they'd come, and I was upstairs getting ready to preach, uh, and somebody in the church ran upstairs, knocked on on the door and said, Pastor Jeremy, some of the teenagers have come in. What are we going to do? <laughs> I said, well, give them a Bible. Give them a hymn book. Show them to a seat. I'll be down in a minute. <laughs> and we'll start the service. Why should we be afraid? Now, they weren't easy. And they walked out of the service after the first few minutes... Most of them I wasn't able to see again for various reasons. But sometimes, especially as we become mature as Christians, we feel perhaps a distance from the unconverted. Maybe we become cold 
or even proud. And we begin to think of us rather than, and them, rather than us, the saved sinners, and those dear people, the sinners who still need to be saved. And we forget that we have not been, we do not have anything that we have not been given. We lose some of that humility. And for many new Calvinists, there is a real and a wonderful desire to take the gospel out and to preach it to every creature. Now, some of them will say that the old Calvinists, as they call them, never used to do that. Now, I'm not accusing Pastor Brian of just being an old Calvinist, but the very fact that he is here, I think, gives the lie to that idea. Nevertheless, not every old Calvinist, as opposed to the new Calvinism, has always been as forthright and as eager to spread the gospel as should be the case. But, missional for what? When they bring the gospel, remember that it's usually the gospel according to the new Calvinist. And so it's not necessarily all and everything that you might wish it to be. Then they are immersed and inventive. By that I mean that they love the truth and they're clever about communicating it. They love theology. They do a lot of reading. They buy a lot of books. They engage deeply with the truth. And that's a wonderful thing. They also use especially new media and technology very effectively. Again, it will have a new Calvinist flavor, but when blogging was big, they'd be bloggers. They're on Facebook. They're on Twitter. They've got good, clean, clever, well-designed websites. They've got a very powerful presence. They know and are willing to think, how can I communicate to the people that I am trying to reach? Now, that's wonderful. If you read blogs, go on Twitter, have a Facebook account, and are part of their target audience. But what if you're not? For some new Calvinists, it's all about taking the gospel to the, uh, what would be called hipsters. You know, young, cool adults who you know, take a skateboard to work and listen to the latest music on their headphones. What if you need to take the gospel to an old lady in a nursing home? What if you need to take the gospel to an upper class businessman? What if you need to take the gospel to the children on the streets? See, all these people need the gospel. Not necessarily just the cool people. Not necessarily a narrow section. You know, we want to preach the gospel to every creature. And while the new Calvinists are often very effective in their narrow target range, I think there's a question as to whether they are as inventive when it comes to the broad scope. You also need to be aware that the medium makes a difference to the message. The way you communicate has an impact on what is communicated. I can't go into too much detail on that, but if you only communicate, for example, by Twitter with 140 characters, are you going to have a rich, deep, nuanced theological statement? Can you make any rich, deep, nuanced theological statement in 140 letters and spaces? Well, no. So you be aware of the, the impact that that has. And then they are attached to preaching. Again, at its best, the new Calvinism is a preaching movement. And most of the conferences would be committed to preaching the word of the living God. And where that is genuine, then I would praise God. Because even when I disagree with that person, I would at least be able to say, now, brother, sister, shall we sit down with an open Bible and ask God himself the questions that we have about what we believe and how we live. If someone is committed to the word of God as the word of God, and ready to preach and proclaim it as the word of the living God, then I believe that God can accomplish something by them, and that we have much in common. What does the Bible say? Somebody who sincerely asks that question is asking a good question. So, where some of these things would be in place and where some of the dangers are absent, especially at their worst, I would be happy to call these men true brothers in Christ. 
Remember, we're dealing with a spectrum. At its best, the best men in the movement, at their best, would all be holding to some of these things in exactly the same way that most of us would. And like Barnabas, remember when he went down to Antioch, what did he do? He praised God for the grace that he could see in the church, and he spent time there dealing with the things that they hadn't got right yet. Now, I think it is right, like Barnabas, to praise God for everything that is right, because it is all a token and a triumph of the grace of God. The other thing we should remember is that God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. If he didn't, none of us would ever be able to do anything useful. Do you understand the image I'm using there? You know, you may have a crooked stick, and you say, well, that's a very bad stick. Ah, yes, but in the hands of God, it can still draw a straight line. We are not perfectly straight sticks, but God can still use us to accomplish something that is honouring to him. That's true of everybody. It's true of me and you as much as it's true of any new Calvinist. I also think we need to heed the words of Matthew Henry. He says, Christ will have those that follow him to observe and take notice of the great examples of faith that are sometimes set before them. Listen to what he says. Especially when any such are found among those who do not follow Christ so closely as they do in profession, that we may be shamed by the strength of their faith out of the weakness and waverings of ours. Matthew Henry says that we may believe more and more clearly in some things than some new Calvinists. We may have more light than they do. But if they have more heat than we do with less light, then we have something to learn. And we should be able to look at those men and say, if they with less light can still live and serve God in that way, then shame on me that having the truth that I know, I do not live and serve God as they do. So at its best, it is a God-centered and God-exalting movement. As you look along that spectrum, these are some of the things that you will see at the best end. And where they are all present, and there are few of the cautions and concerns that apply, you're dealing with what can be God-centered and God-exalting. However, there are also cautions and concerns coming on to the next slide. I know I'm using some fairly technical language here, but we'll run through it and hopefully explain some of it. Now again, remember the spectrum. We are not saying that everybody who believes and practices in accordance with the first six things also believes and practices all these things. But some people who call themselves new Calvinists will be dealing with some of these things. And we need to be aware of where there are dangers. And the problem is that they all sit together in the same big tent. They're all wearing, if you like, blue shirts. They're all saying we belong together most of the time. Six cautions and concerns. The first is commercialism and pragmatism. Commercialism and pragmatism. At its worst, the new Calvinism treats the church of Jesus Christ more like a business than the house of God. It is the entrepreneurial spirit run wild in the house of God. Now, you know what I mean by entrepreneurial? The man who thinks, how can I make this work? How can I make money? How can I move forward? How can I get a profile? How can I make this machine grow? It seems as if, for some new Calvinists, the most important thing in the world is to get big, to get famous, to get influence, to get power, and even to get money. That's not true of all of them, remember. But it seems to be sadly true of some, and the longer this movement goes on, the more apparent that is becoming. Now, you would expect that, sadly, in any large movement but it is becoming clearer in the new Calvinism. Some men seem willing to hire and fire anyone 
in order to get this bigness and influence and financial gain and prominence accomplished. Because those are the great ideals. A few years ago now, the American Time magazine pronounced that the new Calvinism was one of the ten big ideas that's changing the world right now. And all over the blogosphere, new Calvinists were fainting. Oh, how wonderful! Look, we've got a seat at culture's table. They're listening to us. I don't find anywhere in my Bible that the world ever said, this is a wonderful thing that's changing the world. Now, that's not quite Time magaz- what the way Time magazine put it. They were fairly dismissive of some things. But I think the closest thing you get in the Bible is this. The men who've turned the world upside down have come here too. And what did those men do? They went on preaching the gospel. But some new Calvinists just seemed to be excited that at last they were being recognized by the world. So the concern becomes what works, or at least what seems to work, as opposed to what is right and godly. And what works is what brings in the numbers generates the finances and increases the profile. There's a lot of concern about statistics. There's a lot of showmanship. There's a lot of performance. The emphasis on size and impact is allowing some people a free pass. It doesn't matter for some how far outside the walls of orthodoxy you're standing. If you've got a huge church and a great profile, and sell thousands and thousands of books, then we want to learn from you. Even if you are a heretic. Now, does that mean that the smaller we are, the better we are? (laughs) No. Does that mean if no one ever pays any attention to us, we must be doing something right? No. But size and influence are not God's measures of success. They may be a measure of gospel blessing, but they are not the only measure, and they are not the things that must be pursued. Because it is by God's word and by God's spirit, and not by the might and power of man, that God accomplishes his kingdom purposes. The church of Christ is not a business. And no man should be allowed to change it, to mold it, and to fashion it so that it becomes such. That works out, including in such things as what are called multi-campus churches. Where you have the big man, stands at the front, he's on camera, and all around the city, there are other congregations who are listening to him preach. So it's one church, but it meets in 20 different places. Now, that's not one church in 20 different places. If it were at its best, it would be 20 churches, each of them with its own pastors and elders caring for the flock of Jesus Christ. In some of these circles, the big man will preach the previous Sunday two or three times. They'll choose his best sermon. They'll edit it so it looks good and then they'll broadcast it the Sunday afterwards. Now that sounds to me like the world trying to figure out what works, and not like the church of God relying on the Spirit of Christ as a man preaches to other men and women. Then there's a a cultural imbalance and carelessness. To the new Calvinists, culture, generally speaking, seems to be neutral. That means you can take many things out of the world and you can redeem them for Jesus Christ. You can sort of Christianize it. So you can take the world's music and you can take the world's dress and you can Christianize it and you can use those things to attract the world to the gospel. But that is not the way that God works in his word. And the danger is that you end up trying to construct the kingdom of God out of the material of this world. And that's what it looks like. And sometimes you end up with what is called a social gospel, where you're more concerned about men's bodies than you are about their souls. Now, is it wrong to be concerned about men's bodies? Of course not. 
But what is our primary concern? It is the soul, the undying soul. Because whether we live or die, if we are Christians, we belong to God. And whatever is less important than the security of our souls. And we could gain the whole world and lose our souls, and it would be a bad bargain. And there's a danger then that the focus turns away from heaven toward earth. And these, some of these men seem to be trying to bring heaven forward into time. And they lose sight of the difference between what is already and what is not yet. The problem then is that they become slaves to being cool. They have to quote the latest authors. They have to engage with the latest films, deal with the latest pop culture. And so we're trying to redeem it. We're trying to find the, 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 the motif of the cross in the Lord of the Rings or the Matrix or the Hobbit or uh, Jupiter Ascending or whatever the latest film will be. Okay, so you set out to find the motif of the cross in one of those films. And eventually you find something that sounds a bit Christian. And you say, you see, here's an echo of God's truth in the heart of fallen man. Well, I can go and search in a pigsty for one of your smallest coins. I don't know if I've got any on me, but people keep telling me they're absolutely worthless. You know, the tiniest ones? Yeah? I can find one of those in a pigsty. Is it worth going into a pigsty to find that coin? No. What if I've got a thousand peso notes between the pages of my Bible? Okay, I don't have to go swimming around in a pigsty to get them, do I? No, I get the riches of truth without having to get dirty. Rather than jumping into the pigsty and coming up with one tiny coin and say, see, there's something here after all. Now, in some new Calvinism, there's this desperate attempt to find what sounds a bit Christian in the culture, rather than to go to the best and purest sources where God speaks most plainly and say, why don't I just drink clean water? Now those first two things, you'll see them clearly in worship and evangelism. Generally speaking, most new Calvinists have abandoned the idea of the regulative principle of worship. The idea that if we are going to come into God's presence, it is God himself who, who tells us how we should approach. And we are not free to bring something to God and say, I like this, surely you like it too. Or this seems to work, surely it must have God's blessing upon it. For many new Calvinists, they would say, all of life is worship. Level everything out. We worship God on the first day of the week, the second day of the week, third day of the week. We worship God when we gather with his people. We worship God when we, we go to our homes. We worship God when we go to our work and so on and so forth. And there's a sense in which that's true. We're bringing glory to God everywhere we go. That's our intention. But if all of life is worship then actually none of life is worship. See? You've got no high points left. There are no times when you truly draw near to God. Not least, there's no Lord's Day. And the gathering of the saints can be downgraded. There are some new Calvinist churches, not all of them of the same kind, but would basically say we come together for fellowship and for feeding into one another. That's what church is. It all works on this level. What's missing? Worship. Yeah. What's missing is the vertical dimension that we have gathered together to worship God as his gathered people and to enjoy his promise that he will be present with us. Sometimes I think there is a danger that these men then will will rob the church of the glory of God in the name of pursuing the glory of God. There's a, an idea that we must contextualize. We need to become like the world in order to win the world. Now, did Paul say we must become all things to all men that by all means we might win some? Yes. Was he talking about the whole church? No. 
talking about individual Christians. And he was talking about individual Christian liberty. When Paul said that, he was not saying we must change the church so that we can reach the culture. He was saying, I am willing to give up my Christian freedom in order to be able to speak the gospel to the people to whom I am sent. Brothers and sisters, there's a huge difference between those two interpretations. The church is God's creature. It is God's household. We don't get to change it because the world doesn't like it. Our first concern is what is pleasing to our Heavenly Father whose household this is. What we do in order to bring the gospel to our neighbours is a different question to the nature, the identity, the activity, the practice of the church of Jesus Christ. Evangelism. Therefore, if it reaches people, it must be good. Is that true? No. There's lots of ways to reach people that do not communicate the glory of God purity of Christ, the excellence of his salvation, and the need for sinners to repent and believe if they are to enter the kingdom of God. And I think it may have been John MacArthur who first said in this regard that much of the new Calvinism is a Calvinistic soteriology married to an Arminian methodology. Some of you will understand exactly what I mean by that. We believe that God is sovereign in saving sinners, but when it comes to evangelism, we have to play to men's ears and tickle their ears so that they make a choice for Jesus. If we believe that God is sovereign in salvation, we shall be content to use God's means to accomplish God's ends. And in fact, we may even resist Anything that smacks of human performance or gathers human applause to avoid the possibility that we are having a merely carnal impact on the emotions of men and women. Now, is there an emotional impact when the gospel is preached in the power of the Holy Spirit? Praise God, there should be. But that's not the same as setting out to stir up the emotions of a man or a woman. I need to move on quickly. A troubling approach to holiness. There is what I would call an incipient antinomianism. Antinomianism is the idea, essentially, that God's moral law does not apply to the new covenant Christian. And by incipient, I mean that is just starting to bubble up. Now, I don't think it's starting to bubble up anymore. I actually think it's starting to bubble over. There's been tensions within even the New Calvinism about this. Most New Calvinists would call themselves New Covenant theologians. Capital N, capital C, capital T. Now that really annoys me because I think I'm a New Covenant theologian. If you're a Christian, you're a New Covenant theologian. But New Covenant theologian with capitals involves often this idea that we are no longer subject to the moral law, that is the Ten Commandments. That leaves some of the men that I've mentioned holding some things in strange tension. Men like Don Carson have been architects of the modern dismantling of the Lord's Day. If you deal with Christians who say that there's no such thing as, a, as the real a Christian Lord's Day, that the fourth commandment doesn't apply, the chances are that they will ultimately be referring to a book that Don Carson has edited and some of the words that he has written. Those of you men who were here uh, for the conference, you heard uh, Dr. Densham explain that passage from Matthew's Gospel, I have not come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. Well, there's an interpretation of that passage that sounds a lot like I have not come to abolish the law, but to abolish the law. I think that's perhaps not a very nice way, but at least I think that's one way of describing the New Covenant theology at certain points. There's also a confusion about the nature of justification and sanctification. How are you justified? What is God's instrument of justification? Faith, 
Good, okay. I know some of you, you can shout a bit louder if you want to. What is God's instrument of justification? Good. What is God's instrument of sanctification? Okay, good. It's a slightly more difficult question, isn't it? Can you be sanctified without faith in Jesus Christ? No. Because saving faith is God's gift that unites us to Jesus Christ, and it is as we abide in Him and obtain life and strength and health from Him in our souls that we are made more and more like Jesus Christ. But what else is involved in our sanctification? We work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in us both to will and to do for His good pleasure. When it comes to sanctification, is there effort involved? Yes. Do we strive to be godly? Yes. Do we try and obey God's law in the strength that Jesus Christ gives us? Do we do our duty? Oh, are you afraid of the word duty? (laughs) Why are you afraid of the word duty? We are servants of God. Boy, if you believe it, you see... By answering some of these questions the way we are, we've become legalists. That's not true. A legalist is someone who believes you get right and stay right with God by obeying the law. What I've just described is not legalism. What I've described is the life of a saved sinner. With the power of God at work in us, pursuing Godliness or holiness in the fear of the Lord. That is not a legal spirit. That is new covenant theology. When the Holy Spirit indwells us and under His sweet influences, we set out to be what God has called us to be. We try to lay hold on that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold upon us. And I've suddenly realized I'm preaching a sermon about holiness and I need to get back to my lecture on the new Calvinism. But the problem is that some new Calvinists seem to love the imperatives of the gospel, the things that God has done, but they seem to be afraid, sorry, the indicatives of the gospel... The indicatives, the things that God has done, the statements of what God has already accomplished. But they seem to be more afraid of the imperatives, the commands of God. And those two things belong together. Because God has done this, you can and should do that. Because God has accomplished these things, therefore, that's the link. Therefore, obey, do your duty, pursue righteousness. Because God has saved you not in order to be saved by Him. Good works as the necessary fruit of the root of saving faith. Now this is where I think Christian hedonism's chickens have come home to roost. You know what I mean by that? The ultimate effects are now being seen. Now I do not believe for one moment that John Piper means this. But I have heard people argue that if God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him, then God is not being glorified unless I am being satisfied. You see how that changes it around? Now, that's not Piper's intention, I don't believe. But that's the way that some people seem now to be using it. That unless I'm enjoying it, God can't be glorified. So what becomes the measure of God's glory... My enjoyment. I don't find that anywhere in true Calvinism. Then there's a potentially dangerous ecumenism. We've talked about the boundaries. Okay, Just because you're wearing a blue shirt and you say God is great doesn't necessarily mean that you should be part of the gang. And there are some times when those who have called themselves new Calvinists have welcomed as brothers... Those who are heretics. For example, men who deny that God is triune. Now, are such men and women brothers in Christ? No. No. God is the three in one and the one in three. Father, Son and Spirit. Eternal and unchangeable.
That's the worst expression. But there's a lot of undiscerning behavior. For example, at some of the big conferences, big names get invited in because it seems they're big names. Have you heard of Rick Warren? Yeah, Purpose Driven Life. Rick Warren was invited to speak at John Piper's Desiring God conference. Now, you may not think that's a, a big deal, but let me explain why I think it is. Now, I've been criticized for saying I don't understand John Piper's Desiring God conference. That may be true. I accept that I've not been to it. I don't understand its dynamics. But I was told that it's more of a talking shop where different people with different ideas can gather together and it's, it's okay to listen, but to listen with discernment. Well, if that is true we need to take account of certain other things. First of all, a man is known by the company he keeps. Secondly, after Rick Warren was invited to speak at the Desiring God conference and a number of men expressed their unhappiness, John Piper interviewed Rick Warren and offered him a nice set of easy questions and after five minutes said, oh look, we're dealing with a reformed Calvinist after all, aren't we? Read that book. No, we're not. Mr. Warren is a religious chameleon who changes depending on his company, whose handling of the scriptures is not faithful, and who's reaching out to men and women who are not Christians and cooperating with them as if they were is on record. Now, whatever you say about what desiring God is, is as a conference if you invite someone in like Rick Warren and you have an interview that says this is a good man he's one of us and a safe guide you put him on the main platform in fact I don't think they were able to have him in in the end but they put him on the on, on as a broadcast you are basically saying especially if you are one of the main men in the new Calvinism you can and perhaps should listen to and learn from this man and that is a dangerous thing and some dangerous men, especially those with big names, big churches, big voices, and big sales, get invited in because they're big and not because they are faithful men. Then there's a tension with regard to spiritual gifts. Most new Calvinists are continuationists. That is, they believe in the continuing apostolic gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now again, I don't like the fact that they get called continuationists and I get called a cessationist. I'll tell you why. Because the word cessation implies that I believe that the Holy Spirit either doesn't exist or has stopped working. I don't believe that. I am a continuationist. I believe he is still with us, still powerfully operating, and we can do nothing apart from him. But how does the Holy Spirit still work? Does he work in the same ways as he did in the days when he was laying the foundation by the prophets and apostles? Are there still prophecies given? Do we still have apostles in the church? Should we still expect visions and healings and dreams? Most new Calvinists would be open to many of those ideas, and some of them, as I understand it, would even call themselves apostles. Again, I won't go into too much detail in that, but it is a broadly continuationist stream in that sense. Now, when they get together, again, they tend to play safe or safer. When you go out to the individual churches and see these men in their own contexts, some of them, I think, are quite wild. And some of them would lay claim to certain gifts and powers that, as far as I can read in my Bible, God has not afforded to the church after the apostles. And a lot of it will come down to this. Where does God speak? This is his word. This is his word. And there are too many who would follow some of the new Calvinists at this point who I think effectively introduce another source of authority alongside the word of the living God. Now, at its best, 
a man like Wayne Grudem, who has strongly defended the idea of prophecy continuing in the church, introduces a number of checks and balances. Well, you can argue about whether or not those are legitimate. The problem is that in practice, I have not known many people who care one bit about any of the checks and balances. What you find on the ground is, oh, the Lord told me. And that is a very dangerous thing. Because there's only one place where the Lord tells us anything. And it's in the pages of his book and through the preaching of his word. So, where does authority lie? Who is the Holy Spirit? And how does he work? What does he do? And finally, there's a degree of arrogance or triumphalism. And that's been because it's a big and successful movement. And it seemed to sweep a lot before it. And some of the men involved seem to have no regard for kind criticisms and well-meaning. Now, I should say at this point that some of the men mentioned in this book have been in contact with me since I wrote it. And some of them have been extremely generous, gracious and kind in their response. In fact, one of them ensured that this book was sold at the Together for the Gospel conference. I was staggered by that, but it endorsed my commendations, <laughs> at least. Some of them don't understand my British sense of humour. I had to explain some of that and say that I wasn't trying to be as uh, unpleasant as they thought I was. But amongst some, if you're not wearing a blue shirt, you've got no right to speak. If you're not part of a gang, we don't want to know. If you think you've got something bad to say, our ears are closed. We're too important. In, in a negative sense, they sound sometimes a bit like Nehemiah. I have a great work to do. I cannot come down to speak with you. Too many of them, I think, have been blind to friendly criticisms. The virtues of bigness and influence in the eyes of some have blinded them to the quiet voices of men in small churches who may still have something to offer humbly and graciously. But isn't that a danger to which we are all subject, to have our ears open to the truth? wherever it comes. So some closing conclusions and counsels of what is, at its worst, a man-centered and man-exalting movement. Move on to the final slide. Okay, so here you've got this spectrum. Some things that are very praiseworthy and some things that are extremely worrying and dangerous. And all along that spectrum, you've got men and women who call themselves new Calvinists. What should we do? I think, first of all, we should be righteous and treat others as we would wish to be treated. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. How would you feel if somebody burst in at the back door now and said, you reformed Baptists, if that's what you think you are, you're all the same. You all believe this, you all wear this, you all speak like this, you all read this Bible, you all preach like this, you all act like this. Would you think that was fair? No. There are people in this room with some legitimate differences of opinion. And yet we would all call ourselves Reformed Baptists. Now it's a slightly different thing because Reformed Baptists are in part defined by a confession. Not necessarily the same with the new Calvinism. But at least with regard to this spectrum, if you meet someone who says, I am a new Calvinist, allow them to define themselves before you define them, them for themselves. Does that make sense? Ask them, what do you think? What do you believe? How do you act? What are your convictions with regard to these things? Because some of them maybe right up here. And some of them maybe way down here. And some of them maybe all over the place on any number of different issues. Ask genuine, fair questions. But don't assume that all of them are wonderful or that all of them are terrible. Some of them you can have a measure of real cooperation with. Some of them 
you wouldn't want to stand necessarily anywhere near to them. You say, whatever you think you're doing and however you're trying to do it, I do not find that in my Bible and I will not and cannot have anything to do with it at this point. Now, I might still acknowledge that that's a brother in Christ as a judgment of charity, as long as they're not outside the bounds of orthodox Christianity. But I wouldn't say that they're in a very healthy condition. So be righteous. Treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. Do not then overreact positively or negatively. Some people see the new Calvinism going past. It's all bells and whistles. They're big flashing lights. It's, imagine a brand new jeepney sweeping down the street. The music's blaring. Lights are flashing. All the chrome is polished. Wow! I want to ride on that one. And everybody tries to jump on board. Well, the new Calvinism in some circles has been a bit like that. I want to climb on that thing. I want to ride on that one. That's a very foolish thing to do, especially if you don't know what's on the inside. Other people would say, well, here's that new Calvinist jeepney. Let's put some landmines in the road. And let's get some bazookas and let's blow it up as they go past and see if we can take them all out. I don't think that's particularly fair either. We need to react wisely and to make these careful and righteous assessments. We do not need to go out and try and pull them down and kill them. That is not a Christian spirit. But we should not embrace it without discernment, because that is not a Christian spirit either. Consider the work on its merit. Does anybody know the author of the hymn that we sang at the beginning of this service? Okay, Mr. Wesley, Charles Wesley. What was Mr. Wesley? <gasps> An Arminian. What did we do singing one of his hymns? Here is Mr. Spurgeon. I am afraid that most of us are half asleep and those that are a little awake have not begun to feel. It will be time for us to find fault with John and Charles Wesley, not when we discover their mistakes, but when we have cured our own, when we shall have more piety than they, more fire than they, more grace, more burning love, more intense unselfishness, then and not till then may we begin to find fault and criticize. Brothers and sisters, with regard to those commendations, our first concern ought to be to excel ourselves in those things in the best, truest, and fullest sense. And when we have cleansed ourselves and cured ourselves of our faults, that is when we can begin to start really shooting... Oh, that sounds terrible. That's not quite what I mean. Uh, I'm perfect now. Now I can really go to work on you. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, when we are pursuing what is good in the way that they are pursuing what is good, then we can, with some legitimacy and credibility, say to them, have you also seen these things? Are you willing to learn from us as we perhaps have needed to learn from you? To that end, listen humbly to faithful and proven pastors. These men are not your pastors. They do not know you, and you do not know them. When you have questions about some of these things, do not first ask, what does John Piper think? What does Don Carson say? What has Tim Keller taught? Go to the men that you know and love and who know and love you and have proven themselves to be faithful shepherds of Christ's flock and say, Pastor, what does the Word of God say to us? Trust them before you trust others. Then enter into the life of a biblically ordered local church. Do not look out to conferences and coalitions and networks. The one, I, the, the, the one constituted thing, the one body that Christ left behind on earth for the carrying out of His kingdom purposes and the securing of gospel glory for God was the church of Jesus Christ. Let the church 
Have the first and the best of your time and your energy, your commitment and your devotion. Again, strive for the health of the local body before you diversify into some of these other things. Hold fast to tried and tested confessions of faith from credible sources. I'm not saying that what is old is good. But confessions such as the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, they are not the final answer. But they certainly help to establish the boundaries. Those things have been proven over time. The things most surely believed among us. Be suspicious of any confession that confesses less than what the church has confessed for centuries. Then get on with the work that God has given you to do. It's not wrong to be interested in some of these things, but this can all become a distraction. Now we could, this book could have been five or six times as long, but why should I spend my time working on those things when God has given me a gospel to preach, a church to care for, a wife to love, and children to, to raise? We have our sphere. Don't, don't be so concerned with what is going on out there. And then believe in the sovereignty of God and act accordingly. These men are not outside the sovereignty of God. And He will glorify His name. He will do it by us, and He will do it as He wills by them. So don't panic and don't fear. Do you know what God has called you to be and to do? Then be it and do it. And trust God to glorify His name. Because if you live in that way, then I think what will happen is, for some, the new Calvinism will just be the latest fashion. And when it changes, they'll want to move on to the next thing. And there are some who seem already to be asking, what next? Where else do I go? But there are some who will be asking, what more? What else is there to learn? How much further and higher can I go? And I think if we live like this, and believe in this way, and act in this way, then when the time comes that somebody asks, what else? They might even ask you. And you will have a good answer to give. I really appreciate your time. You've listened for a long period. I'm extremely grateful. And I trust that some of that is helpful. What I'll do is perhaps close in prayer. We'll take a few minutes break so that people can stretch their legs. Is that a good idea? Or do you want to run straight into the question and answer? Straight into the question and answer. Well, I'll pray it and we'll pray for more wisdom. And then Pastor Noel, if you want to come forwards. And, or do you want just to do it? Will you come forwards and chair this session? Yeah? Thank you. Gracious God and Father, we pray that if in anything we have spoken wrongly, you would forgive us and take it away from our minds and our hearts. We pray too, our God, that you would help us to learn what it is to live to the praise of the glory of your name in these days. We plead, our God, for wisdom, discernment, love and graciousness toward you and our brothers and sisters. We ask that you would help us even now to be wise in understanding and discussing these things. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.